can be cameras on. We finished our study in preservation, and then now we're in the eighth point in our uh, ten point to study of the doctrine of bibliology, and this is going to be illumination. Illumination. So, uh, first uh, we had the doctrine of preparation, how God prepared the men that He would use to give us scripture, and then there's revelation, uh, different kinds of revelation. There's general revelation, which is you know, we can see the world and its order, and we can thereby discern that there's a creator. So general revelation tells us that there is God, but it doesn't tell us who God is. Uh, you know, you can look at general revelation as uh, the Muslims do and say, oh, there's Allah. Or maybe you look at it as a Hindu does and say, oh, there's all kinds of gods. Or Buddhists, whatever. Uh, it doesn't tell you who God is, but special revelation does. Special revelation tells us who God is. And, uh, and it also uh, tells us right from the very beginning that, uh, that, that God is one God existing in three persons because God says, let us make man in our image. And uh, in the Hebrew language, the, the plural is very specific. Let us make God in our image. And then the Bible tells us over and over again that God is one God, but that God is a Father. And there's a Holy Spirit of God, and then there's the Son of God, so God exists in three persons. And then uh, after Revelation is inspiration, inspiration, and that's the act whereby God breathes out His Word, and He does so through prophets and holy men of God. Then we saw inerrancy, the doctrine of inerrancy. Uh, every word of God is pure, it's perfect, it's God gave His Word without any errors, it's also infallible. Uh, that means it's not going to become an error later on. And uh, it doesn't change. God's word is the same. And uh, it's going to endure just as God does because Jesus, the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God is immutable. God does, that means God doesn't change. So uh, uh, we, we studied that. And then the uh, sixth thing, the sixth thing was the doctrine of Canonicity. Canonicity. Yeah, that's the one that, that a lot of people have uh, maybe some questions about. Uh, but canonicity is not man deciding that God's Word is God's Word. Uh, that they're okay, there's 67 books in the Bible, all the, us, the rest didn't make the cut, we, we didn't choose them to be God's Word. No, it's not that. Uh, canonicity is, is man recognizing God's Word. God's Word is God whether man recognizes it or not, but it's the, it, it has that evident authority where God says, thus saith the Lord. And so, uh, canonicity is that, uh, uh, it's an important doctrine. Then the uh, seventh thing that we studied uh, uh, in the past several weeks is preservation. And today we're going to study illumination. And it is the illumination, uh, a definition of that is the inward act of the Holy Spirit of God shedding light on the Word of God in human minds, allowing the truth of Scripture to be comprehended in its meaning and application. Its meaning and application. I, can, can you understand me okay if I have the mask on? No, 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 no. Not mess program, just the news program. I can't okay. <laughs> Well, the reason I ask is because I can't understand Korean at all when I'm talking to somebody and they have a mask on. It's like, it's, it's uh, you know, I've been in Korea for 22 years and I studied Korean before I came to Korea, but for some reason, if I can't see somebody's mouth, I can't understand what they're saying. So it's probably uh, some sort of, uh, you know, mental handicap on my part, but I just want to make sure you speak English much better than I speak Korean. So, yeah, so I just uh, wanted to check. All right, let's look at a couple of scriptures. Let's start with Acts chapter 26. Some illustrations in scripture of, uh, of the doctrine of illumination. Acts 26. We're going to read verses 15 through 18. And uh, I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise 
and uh, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And uh, so this is illumination. So God said that he was going to use the Apostle Paul to illumine the minds of, of uh, Gentile people who worship false gods, who worship Jupiter and Mars and, and the pantheon of Greek gods, and uh, use the Apostle Paul to illuminate the truth in their minds. And that's what Scripture does. The Word of God can illumine our minds to the truth, to the truth. And uh, so I think that's a good passage to illustrate illumination. There's another good passage. It's uh, maybe, it shows us a little more uh, specifically uh, some things about illumination. But 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5. The Apostle Paul, uh, speaking to the Corinthians in my speech, and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Um, do you remember where Paul was at before he went to Corinth? Before he went to Corinth, he was in Athens. And uh, when he was in Athens, he preached that, that brilliant sermon on Mars Hill. And he talked about, even even quoted uh, Roman poets, or Greek poets, I'd rather. And, uh, you know, it was, even today, people take that message in, from uh, Mars Hill that Paul preached in Acts chapter 17 as an example of, of what good preaching should be. But the fact is, hardly anybody got saved through that message. And it seems like Paul maybe changed his approach a little bit in dealing with Greek people uh, when he went to Corinth after, after visiting Athens. And he said uh, unto you, he said, I, I didn't come preaching powerful words. Instead, he said, I came in the demonstration of the power of the spirit, of spirit, the spirit in Christ, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And uh, so uh, sometimes illumination, it's not because the preacher is a great preacher. Or, you know, there's a lot of different things that the Holy Spirit of God can use to illumine truth of the word in our minds. And it's not always a great preacher. Sometimes it's just somebody who possesses the Spirit of God, and they're not a preacher, they're maybe not even a regular teacher in their church, but God uses them to illumine the truth in somebody else's mind. Uh, look in uh, verses 14 through 16 of this chapter. The natural man receiveth, the natural man there means unsaved. So when we're born in our natural state, we're unsaved. Uh, the Bible says that in, in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, that, that doesn't mean my mother sinned. That means I was a sinner when my mother conceived me, is, is what the prophet said. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness under him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For he who hath known, who hath known the mind of God... Uh, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. And so having the mind of Christ is to be illumined to the Word of God. And the natural man, he's never going to understand the Bible. There, there, are, there are actually uh, unbelieving professors, unbelieving men, liter literature professors and so forth, that can quote uh, great parts of the Bible from memory. Uh, there's Jewish men that uh, can quote... Most of the first five books of the Bible from memory, all of those he begat so and so, and he begat, and then he begat, they know them all. Uh, but they don't know the truth because the Holy Spirit hasn't illumined their mind uh, to the truth 
of their own sin and, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, the, the illumination is, is a significant doctrine. Let's look in Ephesians chapter 1. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, go eat popcorn. General Electric So, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, the Bible says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Uh, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And uh, that's a really long sentence there, Ephesians chapter 1. But uh, the gist of it is, is that uh, the Holy Spirit of God can illumine and enlighten our minds uh, to the truth of God's Word. Also in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of affliction. Uh, so, Paul, I, I don't know if it's Paul or not who wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, some people make a big deal about it. I don't, I don't really care if it was Paul or Barnabas or uh, whoever else. I don't care. Uh, I just know that it was written to the church, that uh, the, probably the church at Jerusalem, during that time when there was great persecution. And many, many of them were considering whether it was worth it to stay faithful to the name of Christ, or whether they should just go back under the fold of Judaism. And so the writer here is, is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, and urging them to remember the former days in which after they were illuminated, that means after they, the, the truth of God's Word uh, was revealed in their mind, that, that they had to endure that uh, great fight of affliction. And every one of us had that, if we know Christ as our Savior. Maybe last week I didn't, when I uh, preached the morning message about... Uh, you know, having having a confidence about our salvation. Uh, sometimes I, I don't want to make it sound like my experience should be the same as everybody else's, because it's not. Everybody's salvation experience is different, and especially when you're saved at a young age. I think at a very young age, a child can realize that they're a sinner, can realize that there's a God, and they want to be saved from their sin. Uh, that can happen at a very young age, but children just don't remember things the same way that they do th that we do as an adult. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, for some people, uh, some people I think seem to, to to place their confidence in something other than than their own salvation experience. In other words, they, they put their salvation maybe in their parents' faith. Or they put their salvation experience based upon somebody told them that, uh, you know, they must be a Christian because they're faith with the church. Well, <laughs> there, you know, there's lots of people very faithful to church that aren't saved. Uh, I think I mentioned before one time when we were passing out gospel tracts, knocking on doors, inviting people to church when we helped start a church in Madison, Wisconsin. And then knocked on the door, and an old man came to the door, and, and we invited him to church. He said, oh, I'm a member of that uh, certain Lutheran church just down the street. I've been, uh, he said, I've attended every Sunday for 72 years. That's what he said. I, I don't know how somebody attends every Sunday for 72 years. I mean, you would think that you'd go on vacation or get sick or something. But anyways, he said, I was in church every Sunday for 72 years. And so we said, that's, that's just wonderful, tremendous faithfulness. When, when did you get saved and come to, do you know for sure that if you died, you'd go to heaven? And he was like, no, I don't know how you can know for sure you're going to go to heaven. 
And uh, so he was very faithful, but he didn't know that he was saved. Uh, he didn't think that anybody could know that they were saved. But uh, so uh, everybody's experience in this, in having the truth eliminated in their heart and mind, it doesn't have to be the same, but you, you do have to be able to know that, that, that there was a time when you asked Christ to forgive your sins and, and to save you. And uh, um, that's what the writer here was urging them to remember, that, that they remember that. And in my particular case, even though I was at a young age, just seven years old, I, I remember it very clearly. Very, I don't remember the name of the camp director. Uh, I don't even remember the name of the camp. <laughs> but I know that I was at camp, at uh, church camp, and uh, they, the, there was a preaching, and they preached about salvation, and I sat there listening as a seven-year-old boy, and I wasn't sure that I was saved. And I wanted to be saved. And so they gave the invitation. I raised my hand. And apparently I was the only one that raised their hand. And so afterwards, the camp director uh, took me into the, the, the cafeteria, the mess hall place. And, and uh, he sat down next to me with a Bible. And he read some verses. And he explained salvation. He asked me if I'd like to receive Christ as my Savior. And, and, and I did. And from that day to this, I've not had any doubts. Now I know some folks that, you know... Uh, just because my personality is different than other personalities. And uh, some people struggle with doubts and some people don't struggle with doubts. Uh, Satan probably tempts me in different ways than he does others. And uh, I know, I've known some people that Satan wanted to get them doubting their salvation. Uh, or I've known preachers that, that had tremendous doubts. They, they lived almost in... in uh, constant, uh, just real emotional struggle because uh, they felt like they were never good enough. They never, they could never achieve what what they ought to, uh, you know, because they're a pastor, they're supposed to be able to walk on water and, you know, they're supposed to be able to get up and preach and, and hundreds of people will come forward and get saved and they're supposed to counsel somebody who's having marriage problems and in 15 minutes solve the problem and the marriage is healed and they, they go out of the place arm in arm back in love with each other. But that never happens. You know, it just... It, those kinds of things are unrealistic expectations. And uh, so uh, I, I, I understand that everybody has a different experience, but uh, the illumination, there, there has to have been a time when the truth was illuminated in our hearts. But it goes beyond that. It's not just the illumination of when, when the gospel made sense to us and brought conviction in our heart and we received it. There's also illumination to the truth because, because this is a big book and there's a lot of doctrine here. And some things we don't understand right away. But later we begin to understand them. Uh, you know when, when, when uh, you're a little child and you, you go off to school and in elementary school you know, kindergarten, first grade, they teach you how to count one, two, three, four, five, and then they teach you how to add and subtract. And then eventually they, they teach you simple division and multiplication and simple fractions and so forth. But by the time you get to uh, middle school and high school, they're, they're putting in algebra and calculus and trigonometry in there. If you put algebra and calculus and trigonometry in elementary school, they just look at you like, you know, and because it's too immature to to do that, and plus you have to that knowledge has to be built on top of each other, and it's the same way with language. You teach children, you know, children learn how to talk by listening to their parents, but eventually they're taught the parts of speech, and then they're taught, you know, uh, different different uh, uh, patterns and so forth, and th then they learn how to, uh, you know, express themselves more advanced than they did when they were just in elementary school. And uh, it's the same way with biblical knowledge. It has to be, a lot of it has to be learned, and so we, we, we get this illumination to truth. Um, look, if you would, in uh, 1 John chapter 2. 
Excuse me. Yes. When I say spiritual illumination, yes. is it very similar to inspiration in the Bible? In the Bible? It, it's not. No. It's not. Because uh, illumination just means we begin to understand. We, it's, it's our understanding of what God has said or what God has done. But inspiration is a miracle. Inspiration is, the, is that act whereby God breathes out words that, that they're God's words. And He does it through, through men. And the men aren't perfect, but the words that they write are perfect. And so inspiration is a miracle. Illumination, it isn't a miracle. Uh, in the same way that I don't really even believe that preservation is a miracle. I believe preservation is providential. That God just works it out. And he works it out through men. Um, but, but illumination is just what is going on in our minds when we recognize that truth and receive it in our hearts. And uh, so, I don't know, maybe some people might say that, you know, that's, that's a miracle. But uh, I, I don't know. Uh, it's not the same miracle as inspiration. The, the word inspiration, you can use it widely. Mean, widely mean yes. In, when I say inspiration. Not only for the Bible, but the Bible right here. Right. A lot of people would say that, you know, uh, you know, Dickens or, or Shakespeare, you know, was very inspired and or inspired many people like that. Yeah. Uh, but that's a little bit of a different word. Um, you know, in Greek, the word is, I guess, you know, in English, we just say inspiration. But in Greek, the word is theopneustos, which means uh, breathed out. It means God breathed. And so it, it would have been a different word. I don't know how we we maybe don't have a singular word in English to express that same concept of God breathed words. Um, so, but uh, it, illumination is I don't know. We you you've seen the cartoon and the, the, the all of a sudden the light bulb comes on over the guy's head. I, in in a way, that's what illumination is. It's it's where you. The, where suddenly something that you didn't understand or didn't know, now, now it becomes uh, a truth that, that you accept and embrace. So, uh, 1 John chapter 2, let's read a, a couple passages in this chapter. Uh, 20 and 21, um, but you have an unction. An unction is like that, an urge or, or some uh, uh, power given over to you. Uh, you have an unction from the Holy One, <coughs> and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. So he's saying, you, you have received the truth. You know the truth. Verse 27, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things in his truth and is no lie. Even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him, him being the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, this is uh, this is just some verses that I think illustrate a little bit about the doctrine of illumination, understanding the truth. And uh, we're going to start considering the explanation of it, and uh, we'll, we'll probably get more into that next week. Uh, but let me just give you uh, uh, a couple of sentences here about an explanation of it. We, we need illumination because men's minds are spiritually darkened. Remember that passage we read in 1 Corinthians, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Um, there... I, uh, I took a Korean language class years ago with uh, a man, and he was uh, retired from the U.S. Air Force. And uh, he had a Ph.D. Uh, in meteorology. And he worked for the Air Force as, as a weather forecaster, as a meteorologist. And he worked at the Joint Typhoon, whatever what it's called, warning whatever in, in Guam. And uh, he ended up marrying a Korean lady, and so he was taking uh, Korean language classes with me at Yonsei Hong Kong. And uh, he, uh, he, 
he didn't believe in God at all. And I gave him some books to read, you know, because he, he uh, you know, he just believed what he had been taught as a, as a scientist, that the earth was millions and millions and billions and billions of years old and, and things like that. And I gave him some books that presented uh, a, a, a very good alternative to evolution, that God created this world and that the, all the geological layers that you see in the earth are all the results of the Noah flood and uh, that... That, you know, but ultimately, ultimately, he said, you know, I looked at all this stuff and the evidence is compelling, but he says, I choose not to believe in God and therefore I discount all that. And so, essentially, he was saying, don't bother me with the truth. I've made up my mind. I'm not going to believe in God no matter how compelling the evidence for God is. I'm just simply not going to believe and, and that's, that's a mind that's spiritually darkened. And he's a highly educated guy. Actually, I liked him a lot. Uh, he and I would have been great friends. Um, uh, except for the fact that, that he refused to believe in God. And uh, so we need illumination because everybody's minds are, are darkened. And so uh, there are, I guess we could say there are four different levels or four kinds of spiritual darkness. And that's what we're going to look at next week when we come back. Four, four different levels of, of spiritual darkness. And, and because this, this has some bearing on illumination. Uh, a mind like his, that's very dark. And, and he's shutting out all light. But others, others are not quite as, as hardened to truth as he is. And uh, so we'll, we'll continue on in our study of illumination next week. Lord, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for each one that's here today. And again, we praise you, God, for the salvation.